Hey guys, so we are in our last unit for the year for AP Bio, and this unit's going to be on evolution and ecology. Now, it's not the last chapter, it's the last unit, so chapter, I think, 24 is our last chapter uh, of the year. So we're starting that, like I said, evolution, ecology. We're going to start off with evolution today, and then after that, we're going to start reviewing for uh, the AP test, which is in May. All right, so your book starts off talking about moths and butterflies. And they both have a caterpillar stage to them. What this means is, at first, they're going to be uh, land-dwelling organisms where they can't fly. But later on, they will morph into a flying uh, organism. So three things, three observations from this are <clears throat> we have an environment, and these organisms fit into that environment. Second one, the shared characteristics of life. Um, even though moths and butterflies are completely different organisms, they both have this caterpillar stage to them, right? And then also, again, they're two completely different organisms. Uh, the diversity of life, right? Two completely different organisms turning into uh, still two different organisms, but they share some things with one another. They both have wings, okay? All right, so going back a long time ago, you know, 150 years ago, to... Charles Darwin. And what Charles Darwin did was he published this book called The Origin of Species. Now, Charles Darwin, I, I know you guys know the story about him going to the Galapagos Islands. We'll talk about that a little bit. But he came up with his idea of descent with modification. Now, what, when Darwin was on the Galapagos Islands, he knows, noticed that the species there now look somewhat like species from a long time ago. And they studied fossils and different things in the rocks, and he was able to make observations and connections between them. So Darwin did not say evolution. What Darwin said for his phrase was descent with modification. So he tried to steer clear um, of that word evolution, but later on it blossomed into evolution. But what he was saying was that organisms actually descend, they go through generation to generation to generation with different modifications. <clears throat> All right, so let's go, we're gonna talk about Darwin. We're also gonna talk about what happened before Darwin. Now, as I said, guys, Darwin was on the Galapagos Islands. Um, he studied so many different organisms on there, okay? Along with uh, reptiles, he also studied the birds, the finches, that was the main one. But he also even studied all the orchids on the island and different uh, plants. So it wasn't just uh, animals and things in the animal kingdom or the, the reptile kingdom. It was actually plants as well. So let's go back throughout history. Now, I'm not trying to get biblical on, on you here. Um, but a long time ago, ancient Greece, there was a philosopher uh, named Aristotle. And what Aristotle did was he arranged different things in the universe, universe in quotations there, um, based on kind of like a step system. You can see all the steps there. And at the top step would be the most important one. So what he did, guys, is he said, okay, we're going to start off with God as being the most important. Again, I'm not trying to get biblical on you. I'm just trying to give you the history of it. He then went to angels then went to demons, which are fallen angels. He said below that, we are going to have the stars and the moon. After that, we're going to have uh, the kings, the princes, the nobles, and then going down, we have the commoners. Commoners would probably be like me and you. Below that is where we're going to have wild animals, and then domesticated animals, and then below that, we're going to have trees, plants, all right, anything in the plant kingdom. And then he actually grouped non-living things, which is like precious stones and precious metals and minerals, okay? So he started off with, you know, God, which I'm not going to get into that. But then he went to stars and moons, which are really not living things. Then he went to the living things. Then he went back to non-living at the end, all right? That was how he grouped things. So long after his time, um, we had a guy named Carl Linnaeus, all right? So... What Carl Linnaeus did, um, 
he said that a creator, now he didn't really use God in this, but he said a creator uh, had designed each species for some purpose. So we have pretty much like an ecosystem and each different organism serves some purpose in that. So what he did was he founded this science called taxonomy. So he just classified organisms based on some similarities of other organisms, how close they were in uh, looks to those other ones. And he came up with a system called binomial nomenclature. Now, with binomial nomenclature, and I know you guys learned this in seventh grade, so we should probably review it. Um, every single organism in the world is going to have two names. I'll just use ours as an example here. All right. Homo sapiens. All right. Homo is our genus name. For our genus name, we always capitalize the first letter. All right. And then sapien is our species name, and we do not capitalize that. All right. So throughout history, we have had more than just Homo sapiens be in the genus Homo. Um, we had Neanderthals, okay, different species. Still genus Homo, but uh, I believe the species name is like Neanderthalus for that. Okay, so just different uh, organisms, even though we share the same genus. So if two organisms share the same genus, they're really close together but their species names might be different. Okay. Okay, so as we already talked about, guys, Darwin, when he was on the Galapagos Islands, he studied a bunch of fossils. Now, when he was studying these fossils, some of them, it was an island, a bunch of islands, some of them might have been right on top of the rocks. Others might be a little bit further down into the rock. During the rock formation, we had different letters, le levels uh, of rocks. And you, if we look at it, like I know it's hard to see because we usually don't have cross sections of, of rocks, but if you look at the Grand Canyon or things like that, we get to see all of these different rock, uh, they're called strata, all these different layers of rock. And each one, as we go down, represents an older rock, okay? So as we go down in strata, the, the rock is obviously more ancient. Here's a good example here. Now, obviously, the top is water, but underneath the water, we would have, I guess, this gray color here, then this orange-red color, then a brown color, then a gold color here. But as we go down, we are getting to older uh, generations. Now, with Darwin, he was studying all these different fossils that were located in these rocks. So he knew if there was a fossil right here, he knew that it was pretty recent. If we found a fossil down here, he knew that it was a little more ancient. What he was able to do, if we call this number one, this number two, he was able to compare number one and number two with different organisms that were still around and see, hey, what similarities are there and what differences are there between them? All right. So still before Darwin, um, George Cuvier, another scientist. He was a paleontologist, so he studied fossils. He came up with this, the theory of uh, catastrophism. So what he was saying that in our strata, we're going to have some boundaries in it. And the strata is going to change from one layer to the next. He hypothesized that each one of our layers, when that change happened, we had some catastrophe happen there. When we have a catastrophe, um, we had a lot of different species become destroyed. All right, So something happened. We don't know what happened. But the ones that were the most fit were able to survive the catastrophe. The ones that were not so fit, they died in the catastrophe. If we go back to the Jurassic era, obviously a lot of the different species died during whatever catastrophe happened. If it was a meteorite, if it was a volcano, whatever. 
but we had a lot of species die. The ones that were left over, if you think about what kind of organisms uh, or dinosaurs today, we have uh, chickens, we have some birds, we have like alligators, that kind of thing, but things that could fly and things that were underwater. It seems like all the land organisms didn't survive. So that tells us that whatever catastrophe happened there, the land organisms probably got affected the most. All right, two geologists we got to go over, Hutton and Lau. Um, before them, before them, now, again, guys, um, this was, you know, before uh, Darwin, but during Hutton and Lyle's time, everyone believed that Earth was only a couple thousand years old, and they also believed the populations never changed, so everything kind of stayed the same, all right? Um, what they hypothesized was that Earth's surface changes and it's a very slow change so we don't really recognize it because by the time earth changes you know we're probably already dead all right um but they said that earth is constantly changing over time and we can't really speculate that earth is only a thousand years old because we don't see those changes because we're dead beforehand Okay, one of the last scientists we have to go over here. This is Lamarck. Lamarck was around the same time as Darwin, maybe a little bit before, but roughly around the same time. So Lamarck hypothesized that species evolved through use and disuse of body parts uh, over time. So let me explain to you what this means. I got a bonsai tree here. This, based on Lamarck's theory, said that, okay, I'm going to cut this bonsai tree in a certain pattern. If I cut it in that pattern, technically, wherever that branch grew out at, I'm no longer using that branch. If I'm no longer using that branch, if this bonsai tree reproduces, the next generation shouldn't even have that branch, okay? Because the generation before wasn't using that branch. This is with plants. Let me explain to you a better example with animals. So we have a nice giraffe here. <clears throat> this giraffe is probably, I don't know, nowadays giraffes on average are like 14 feet high, somewhere around there. So probably like three times as high as us. So this giraffe is able to reach the trees very nicely. Now, Lamarck also said that we have some smaller giraffes here. So at the time, and I'm not trying to draw a draft here, but all right, we've got our legs here. This is the best draft ever. Enjoy this. <laughs> okay, so there's my other draft. It's fabulous. But you guys can see, I drew this one much smaller. Now, is it a good draft? No, it's horrible. I get it, but. This will help us with our analogy here. Uh, Lamarck was able to find in the fossils, hey, look, there's giraffes with short necks. And he also found that there's giraffes with big necks. And he found that the short neck giraffes were a little bit further down in the fossils than the long neck giraffes. So here was his hypothesis. Lamarck said that, okay, I'm going to predict that the short neck giraffes, they really wanted that food up there. So what happened was they really stretched their neck as far up as they could, right? And over time and over generations, their neck actually got bigger and bigger and bigger because the ancestors were trying to stretch up as far as they could. So the kids were able to actually get um, bigger necks, okay? Now, this was absolutely incorrect. That did not happen. In reality, the situation was much sadder than this. What was going on, guys, was that the short-necked giraffes first ate all this vegetation down in this area, all right? And there was a bunch of short-necked giraffes, not just a few. So all this vegetation right in here got eaten by the short-necked giraffes. After that was all gone, 
they pretty much ran out of food. So now they had to try to reach up and get this vegetation up here. Problem is they couldn't reach it, and they tried, but they couldn't get it. The long-necked giraffes, they were able to eat up there, so they still got food. The short-necked giraffes, they unfortunately, sad story, but they were unable to get food, they starved, and they died, which is why we were able to find the fossils of the short-necked giraffes. Okay, so more of the story, guys, Lamarck was wrong. Uh, characteristics throughout like an organism's life, so this giraffe trying to reach up and maybe get a bigger neck, that's not going to be passed on uh, the next generation through genes. Some things through life experience are, are passed on, but things like this, they do not get passed on all right, to your next generation. This is a trait. This is something in your genes. And if you have a short neck uh, giraffe and it's trying to, uh, we could say, change that allele into a long neck one, that doesn't happen. We're not going to be able to change alleles here. So instead of Lamarck's theory that the short neck giraffes stretched their necks up and got bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah, that didn't happen. Instead, they starved, they died. The long neck giraffes were able to eat more, the long neck giraffes were able to survive and the long neck giraffes were able to reproduce, passing those long neck alleles on to the next generation, which is why almost all giraffes have longer necks now, and we don't see many short neck giraffes anymore. So that was uh, Lamarck's theory, and you guys could see how we kind of pretty much disprove, disprove that. Okay, so section two little history on Darwin here. We're just going to go over a little bit of it today. So Darwin first studied medicine. Uh, he had very wealthy uh, parents. So he started to study medicine at Cambridge University. Didn't do so hot, so he changed to theology, which is pretty much uh, religion. So he got invited to go on a ship uh, called the Beagle, and it was sailing around uh, South America, and he was able to go to the Galapagos Islands. All right, I'll post a video for you guys later on Charles Darwin. All right. So he decided to stay at the Galapagos Islands for a little bit, and he studied, like I said, the orchids, all the animals there. Okay, um, pretty much anything he can get his hands on, he was studying. All right. So. What was nice is there was a bunch of earthquakes during this time where Darwin was at. Now you're like, okay, he's in the middle of an earthquake. Why would he want to be there? Well, here was what was good with that. During the earthquake, the ground became a little bit uplifted. It shook the rocks up a little bit. Okay, calm you know, he shook the rocks up. All right, that's probably not the best thing. And it wasn't, but for Darwin, it was fantastic because he got all these other fossils that just got brought up uh, from the earthquakes. So he had more to study. So we talked about Lao, and he thought that Earth was over a thousand years old. Um, people only thought at that time Earth was a few thousand, all right? He didn't really give a number to this, but he's like, okay, maybe uh, 6,000 could be our number, and maybe it's over that, maybe, you know, uh, it's way over that, okay? So he really wasn't sure, so he was speculating, all right? Um, when, when Darwin was on the Galapagos Islands, he said that, okay, we had uh, South America, and he thinks, okay, maybe the Galapagos Islands uh, were a little bit off, and some or animals, some organisms, came over to the Galapagos Islands. And when it says there he, they speciated on the islands, what this means is they came to there, there was a need for that species there, and if there was a need for that species on the Galapagos Islands, that species stayed there, it thrived there, um, it was able to live there with whatever um, things it needed. So here was his, the whole path of the beagle, all right? 
like I said, um, he stayed at the Galapagos Islands over there, and that's where he studied everything. So it was just off the coast of South America. All right, so for this one, guys, Darwin was not the first person to mention that evolution occurs. Now, we talked about Darwin used you know, descent. He used that instead of evolution. Um, he was talking about organisms descending and, and modifying. So he was not the first person. There was a bunch of people before Darwin that said, hey, evolution, evolution exists, okay? Darwin was the first person to provide evidence of evolution through all of his fossils and all the different orchids that he studied. He was the first person to actually provide data for it. All right? And then he talked about the finches. So we'll go over the finches, and then we will uh, call it a day here. So this will be our last slide. But if you guys look at the finches, Darwin said, okay, I think they all originated from one type of finch. And then the beaks began to change based on what they had to eat on a specific island. Now, originally, all of these different finches were probably on all of the islands. So we had this one eating the flowers, the cacti, this one eating seeds, nuts, and this one eating insects. That's why its beak is nice and uh, small, so that way it can get into trees and under bark and things like that. But what happened was maybe one island had all seeds and nuts on it. So this one was able to use its big beak to crack all the seeds. These two were not. So on that particular island, these two either died or went to another island to find food, one or the other. Okay? If they stayed, they definitely died, though, because there was no insects or uh, cacti or flowers or whatever. Okay? So every island had a different food source. And those different food sources determined what birds were going to thrive out on that island and which ones are either going to have to find new food or die, essentially. All right, guys, so let's stop here for today. Um, I think that's enough for us to chew on with Darwin, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a good rest of your day.